September 10th. Uh, so we're continuing through Romans and we are in Romans 5 and we're going to be picking up at the 12th verse there in Romans. So let's begin with the word of prayer. Father, thank you for today, just for blessing us, for bringing us here, for allowing us, Lord, to come, for um, just all that, uh, that you have planned for us. Just give us that hearing ear and we just want to thank you, Lord, uh, for all that you do and just the things that you do show us in your word. And so we just lift up this time now, just commit it to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So in my Bible, the heading over these verses that we're going to look at from 12 to 21, hopefully finish this chapter, the title there is Death in Adam and Life in Christ. And, you know, it is uh, that simple. It's kind of an either or position. And so when that final curtain closes on the theater of your life, what position will you find yourself in when that time comes? And it comes soon enough. You know, sometimes when, you know, when we're, when we're younger, it seems like life's dragging on. I remember high school. It seemed like high school lasted forever. And then after high school, and then when I got married, it's just been slipping away so fast. Like, where do you know, time is just going by. And so the Bible teaches that when that time comes, that believers will be in heaven. Unbelievers will not. But unbelievers will face the judgment. We looked at that last week at the, the white throne judgment. Revelation 20, where the demons and the devil and you know, the unbelievers thrown into the lake of fire um, of judgment. And so I entitled this message, One Way or Another. And so there's no third option. It's one way or another, despite, despite all the false teachings that are out there. Of course, they come up with all kinds of things, third options, other options. There is no third option. There's no such thing as there's going to be annihilation as if the person never existed like some people might teach. You know, quite comforting. Well, if I'm going to be annihilated, I can just do as I choose to do. And it's just a deception or others. Purgatory, you know, if you don't do things in this life, there's always a time when you can make it up in kind of an in-between time. And then, and then your loved ones here, of course, are put under the bondage of indulgences as they light candles and give money to the church to, you know, pay for some of that time of their loved ones in purgatory, you know, teachings like that or nirvana or reincarnation and on and on and on goes all the false teachings of the Eastern mysticism and all that kind of stuff. Really? No, there's no other options. There's just the two. Every man makes an eternal choice and then that choice has permanent consequences. And so Jesus tells us that those who deny him, that he will deny before his Father in heaven in Matthew 10, 33. And so those choices are serious ones and they reflect our relationship with Jesus Christ. And so last week when we finished up in verse 11 there, that verse is, I, I would kind of call it like a bridge there where we ended. Um, and not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have now received the reconciliation. I didn't mention, I don't think, last week that this word in the King James, which is atonement, and I like uh, atonement much better for one, if you kind of break up the word, it gives you the understanding, at one meant. Atonement, at one meant. And it, it is a word that it puts us, we're at one with the Lord. In the Old Testament, atonement meant covering of the blood sacrifices, and they had to be repeated. And they were only for a temporary covering, but they could never take away sin, only cover sin up. 
but in the New Testament, atonement means Jesus has us covered. And it's not a temporary covering, but it's a permanent covering. And so in today's text, you know, in these uh, verses here, the contrast is made that we are born one with Adam by natural birth, and those of us who come to Christ are born again or made one with Jesus who paid that and atoned for our sins. And so you might say that, you know, Jesus is that bridgeway of salvation. And, you know, you see the same message on Mount Calvary, really, where I always thought about that and, and realized, hey, how come Jesus was crucified with two others on Mount Calvary? And, and then the scriptures reveal that one chooses Jesus, the other rejects Jesus, which again gives you the two positions. Uh, there where Jesus spreads out his arms and then one rejects and then one receives. And Jesus being that, that bridgeway. And, um, and so in Adam, all are born with that sin nature. And so in our natural birth, we have a sin nature. But in our new birth, we have a supernatural nature. And that's kind of what these verses are dealing with. And so, verse 12, Therefore, just as through one man entered the world, sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even, even over those who had not sinned, according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. And so when Adam sinned, he brought sin into the world. And every man after him was born a sinner. But it's not that we can blame Adam because every man, the Bible teaches, is responsible for their own sin. And so, you know, looking at uh, Ezekiel 18 in verses uh, 20 through 21, the soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. But if a wicked man turns from all his sins, which he has committed, keeps all my, my statutes and does what is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. And so you have the personal uh, accountability of our sin. And, um, and man wants to kind of shun, shun that responsibility. You know, like even Adam said when he sinned, he what? He said, it's the woman that you gave me, you know. It's her fault. If it wasn't for her, I wouldn't have done what I did. And that's man, what man wants to do. Now, Adam's name means, you know, in application, humanity. And, um, and really, that's the, the parallel given in the Bible. Literally, his name means red earth. But his identity is the first man. And so by looking at Adam as the first man, it explains all of us. And, and so... And so you see in verse 12, therefore, just as through one man, sin entered the world. So Adam, you might say, is like the, like, uh, you know, in, a, in a, the first domino. And, you know, like dominoes, if you were to remove that first domino and push on the second, you end up with the same result. That's the idea. And so, and so by the one man, sin entered the world. 
Now notice, it doesn't say the earth. Because the earth means the planet that we're on. But the world means that you look at people and you wonder what planet they're on. That's what the world means. <laughs> you know, it's the idea that, you know, the earth, it doesn't have a spirit. It's just a big ball of dirt. You know, but on the other hand, the world does have a spirit and is covered with dirt balls. That's the difference. Of course, that's my definition, but <laughs> it helps me to remember. But dirt balls, meaning sinners that need salvation. That's the world. That's what the world represents. And so sin entered the world and death through sin. And you know, we have that record in uh, Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, where it says, Then the Lord God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it, and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. And so there, the point, all sin and temptation follow that same track. In other words, you don't need thousands of examples to make the same point. And, um, you know, as we look at, you know, even in 1 John 2, where you see, um, it says there in verse 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And so, hey, sin is easily identified, easily characterized, you know, the lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life, real simple, that all sin fits under those cate category, you know, categories. But men love to complicate things. God's made things very easily grasped, but men like to complicate things. Wanting to, you know, because it, it really, um, men like to control it's called ego. It's in man's sin nature. So they complicate things. I mean, it's like, uh, do you remember, um, you know, making big words of little things and so that you don't understand it. Rather than helping you understand it, they throw out big words. You ever been around people like that? I have. But I remember when I was a kid, it was something called pig Latin. <laughs> Probably remember it. And, uh, and there was people in, in my circle that could just speak pig Latin like it was another language and they could understand each other. You know, and um, <laughs> it's like, uh, I wrote down, itchinche, oopse. Oh. Who knows it? <laughs> See, now, how do you even know that? <laughs> itchinche, soupse, yeah, I know. Itchinche, soupse. It's like, well, for those who don't know that, think, wow, that guy's really smart. <laughs> Just because you don't know it, itch and say, soup say, oop say, I can't even do it. But see, that's what, it's the idea. You throw, hey, that's called pig Latin, made, made up language. But you throw Latin, you make words real big. Soteriology. Study of salvation. Why don't you just say the study of salvation? Right? I mean, things like that. Eschatology. What's that? Study of end times. Why don't you just say that? Because men love to throw out big words. So that you think they know more than you. And you know what? You see that in the history of the church. What did they do? They tried to keep the Bible from the common person. They did, the church leaders didn't want the common person to have the Bible. Because then the common person would learn of God's grace and love. And then they would lose their power over them. That's the nature of man. And so it's the same with the gospel. You know, the, the, the gospel to the Greeks was foolishness. Why? Because it was too simple. Believe in Jesus Christ. Ask for forgiveness of your sin and you're set free. What about all those men, those religious leaders that wanted the heavy hand over the people? They hated the fact that they'd lose that control. And so... Death 
through sin and thus death, it says, spread to all men like a disease. And no man has an immune system to fight sin. All men die. For all have sinned, all men die. And the only vaccine or antidote, you might say, is Jesus. There's no other. And I know uh, one verse among many is Acts 4.12 that says, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And so death spread to all men because all sinned. And we covered that, of course, Romans 3.23. All have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. But all represented in the one, Adam. It's like, you know, a dog is a dog, has a nature of a dog. And as Proverbs 26.11 tells us, that a dog will return to its vomit. Think how disgusting. Not my little foo-foo. My little foo-foo won't. Yeah, it will. Your little foo-foo, your sweet little thing that licks your face all the time. <laughs> when you're not looking, dogs are smart. They have reputations to guard themselves. And so they'll look around and vomit over there. And if you're around, they might not go to it. But if you're not around, they'll go over there and eat that sucker up. <laughs> then they'll go into the other room and lick your face. That's the nature... <laughs> That's the nature of a dog. I know that's a gross illustration, but regarding man's heart and that same idea in connection to sin, you know, apart from Jesus, that's the nature of man. And men, women included, and, you know, sin can be hidden. So you have sin hidden and things are done in secret. Even, even people harboring within their heart that sin that's there. And so, even when we do not see it in others, we think, oh, you know, they're just the most wonderful person in the world. If, if, if anybody wasn't a sinner, it's them. You know? And we have these unbiblical idea, ideas uh, about people. But guaranteed, sin is present. Because the Bible teaches it and it's very clear. But unlike man's justice system, whoever gets caught committing a crime goes to jail. But there's people out there that's committed the same crime and they run free of that crime because they've never been caught. So it's kind of a farce when you think about it. You have a society of people that's committed all kinds of crime and then a handful of them are in prison. And then everybody looks at the people in prison and go, how horrible. And then there's this big population of the same horrible people, but they don't make the connection. It's like those who sit in prison and then man changes the law regarding the things that they got in prison for. And now it's okay. It's legal. I'm sorry that you spent 10 years in prison for something now that we've made legal. That's called a failed justice system because men are failures in that regard. We do our best and you have to have it. But guaranteed among the justice of men, you will have injustice. There's people in prison right now that are completely innocent. It's a sad thing. But God, on the other hand, is 100% just and accurate. Whatever a man is guilty of God knows. Never confusion, never a misunderstanding. You don't have to worry about God. God, God will misunderstand me. No. And you don't have to worry about that. And then those things done in secret, guess what? He knows. And, and you know, it tells us in, in Hebrews 4, verse 13... And there is no creature hidden from his sight. But all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. 
It's all there. Nothing in secret. In other words, they're not going to be all those people that are able to fool you and me and pull the wool over our eyes and get away with it and live a whole life. They're never going to be able to pull the wool over God's eyes. And there'll be perfect judgment, perfect righteousness. But see, that's why Jesus could say, hey, if a man looks at a woman to lust, then he has committed adultery with her in his heart. Because only God can judge the heart. And so there's that perfect judgment. And so all have sinned. For verse 13, until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed or accounted to when there is no law. And that's interesting because the law comes in multiple forms. Because, of course, you have the written law that came when Moses showed up on the scene. But you also had the law of conscience. In Romans 1, that describes when people looked up at the heavens. Then you have the verbal law, which, of course, Adam, he bailed on. But see, it's the idea of accountability, and that's where the whole subject of accountability. When is there accountability to sin? Well, when sin is made known to the person. And so, and that's where, of course, Adam and Eve, they were naked and they hid themselves. All of a sudden they were guilty because they knew they broke the law. And in the conscious and heart of man, God knows exactly when that happens. We don't. That age of accountability. But at that point, nevertheless, verse 14, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness. And so likeness means not the exact same way, but still sin has many faces. In the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. Well, how is he a type? Well, it's a prototype of Jesus Christ because Adam was all man. It's meaning that Jesus Christ was all man. All man. Facing the same thing. He was a type of him who was to come. But, verse 15, the free gift is not like the offense. Why? Because the offense brought death. The free gift brings death life. One is earned, the other is unearned. That's how it's not like it. For if by the one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And so this gift is that abounds to the many are all those who believe in Jesus Christ Grace abounds as a gift. But in the whole relationship of mankind, the ones that grace abound in, the many are really the few in comparison to all those that reject Jesus Christ because Jesus tells us in John 7, 13 and 14 where he says, enter by the narrow gate for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction and there are many who go in by it because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life and there are few who find it. And so the many to which grace abounds is also the few who believe. And, and then just as the effects of Adam's sin connects to all, so then the effects of the gift that Jesus offers is available to all. To be under Adam, we need only to be born. We have a sin nature, but to be under Jesus, we only need to be born again to have that supernatural nature. Like Jesus said, you know, in John 3.3, 3, unless you are born again, you shall not enter the kingdom of God. And then also, 
we are given a new, we are a new creation in Christ in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. You know, where it tells us that, you know, old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's in our new nature. And then, of course, uh, you know, there is no condemnation in Romans 8, 1. There's no condemnation any longer for us. To those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And so, notice also in verse 15, before moving on, it shows one, one man's offense, little m. Okay, who's the guilty party? <laughs> Hit your button. You're... <laughs> In verse 15, one man's offense, little m. And then you notice the grace given by one man, capital M. That distinction's made. And then verse 16, and the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation. But the free gift which came from many offenses, resulted in justification. For if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. So he's being very repetitious in the point that he's trying to get across, but... I was reading in the Easton Bible Dictionary where it gave a definition of justification, which you see there, the last word in verse 16, and then also righteousness, the same word, it's the same root word there for justification. And, and it's written, justification is the judicial act of God by which he pardons all the sins of those who believe in Christ and accounts, accepts, and treats them as righteous in the eye of the law, as conformed to all its demands, in addition to the pardon of sin, justification declares that all the claims of the law are satisfied in respect of the justified. It is the act of a judge and not of a sovereign the law is not relaxed or set aside, but is declared to be fulfilled in the strictest sense. And so the person justified is declared to be entitled to all the advantages and rewards arising from perfect obedience to the law. And so you just get handed that freedom in Christ, justified just as if I've never sinned, justified. And, and so you see the offenses resulted in justification. How? By confession. We confess our sins, 1 John 1, 9. He is faithful to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then also there, the abundance of grace is a gift of righteousness. Grace, what is it? unmerited favor. I like that, that acronym which says grace, G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace. And that describes it. That gift of righteousness is a gift. Righteousness meanings now you're in right standing before God. And so then in verse 18... Therefore, as through one man's offense or disobedience, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. So that, that condemning um, condemnation for sin was set in motion. Boom, remember? Domino effect. And it's like salvation. It's like God pulls you out of that line. <laughs> You know, just slide you over to the side and then you just watch them all fall down. And, you know, we're, you know, you look, you look at the people around you today. 
You see him, you know, fallen, fallen, fallen into sin, uh, dying without God and all that. And, and, you know, we stand in Christ. And so, you know, one man's judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteousness and the free, free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. And so you have in Jesus Christ salvation, one man, the one way, and salvation comes. So man's natural origin is in Adam, but the flip side is the free gift, then we're connected to then salvation because of Jesus Christ. And then, and then in verse 19, for as by one man's disobedience, Many were made sinners, so uh, also by one man's o uh, obedience, many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord." And so many were made sinners. And again, Adam and Jesus there represented the two conditions of men. And, um, and this is the same image there that we see, you know, as a, again, there at Mount Calvary, that same image. And we were once dead, as it tells us in Ephesians, once dead, but now we are made alive. Ephesians 2.1 tells us that. And so then it says, but their sin, where sin abounded, and I think all of us can attest to know where that sin abounding would be. And where sin abounded, now grace abounded much more. And so sin has no power over the healing and forgiving, forgiving power of grace, like that song we sang, a powerful name in Jesus. You know, we have that in Jesus. God's grace trumped sin, and we triumph now in life because of God's grace. Sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness. And so if a man remains in Adam's camp, he remains dead to Jesus is the idea. He is dead, but yet if he steps by faith into the camp of Jesus Christ, he is dead to Adam and alive to Jesus Christ. And of course, Romans 6, that's exactly the subject that we're headed into. And if you see in Romans 6, 11, there where it says, likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So that's the subject. Of course, it's just a natural step into considering that subject. And so as one man leads the way to sin and death, another man leads the way to righteousness and life. And so men will claim not to believe in God, and there's plenty out there that do. Well, they're already in Adam's camp, born that way, regardless of their confession, and um, in that natural state. But spiritual life comes through Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us that Jesus is called the last Adam in 1 Corinthians 15 where it says there, verse 45 and four, through 47, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living, living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spirit is not, is not first, but the natural, and afterward, the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. And so when you read that, you see the glorified work of Jesus Christ to then bring us into a glorified body. That's the end result. But the end result of Adam is dust. Dust you come, dust you will return. But the spirit 
is made alive through Jesus Christ. And so, then, one last thought, um, where it says there at the end of verse 20, grace abounded much more. Think personally that my sins are gone. Where my sins once were, they are now gone, and I am justified in Christ. And now, grace, that grace might reign. And that speaks of Jesus as king. And so it's the highest order of rule in your life is God's grace. And so don't be fooled into believing or submitting yourself to something less than Jesus Christ, your Lord. And from him extends grace and love. And so don't be subservient to the deceiver and a liar and then be condemned by those things that Christ has died to set you free from. And so that speaks to reigning, superseding anyone and anything else. Once death reigned, now life reigns. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. And so the gospel sets men free, free from themselves. Because you know what? When condemnation comes upon man, it'll be because they're guilty of their own sin, not because of somebody else's sin. And so in the same way, when a man is delivered from their sin, they're delivered because of the same choices that they've made. They've taken that step of faith and said, Lord, I do believe and I recognize that I need you, you know, for eternity. And they've, they've submitted their life to Jesus Christ. And at that point, then, now they've, they're dead to Adam and they're alive to Christ by the supernatural work of his spirit. Amen. All right, let's stand together. Lord Jesus, uh, thank you for your word. And um, we ask, Lord, that your word would have that, do that work in our hearts, building us up for the work that you have for us. We know that we're created in Christ Jesus unto good works. And we can't do those works, good and acceptable works, apart from you. But Lord, when you breathe life into us and our spirit is made alive, then the things that we can do for you are acceptable. So I pray, Lord, that all of us would just be in that place to receive your spirit and also the work of your spirit through our lives. So we want to thank you. We want to honor you in our lives, in our families, in our church. We just ask that you receive all the honor and glory due your name. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.